Brother Fred, it will be okay to give my brother a testimony. You in charge. Let's give glory to God. <laughs> and in my, in my, uh, in my uh, vision, I know that Oscar will preach to all ministers in the United Methodist Church during a time of Congress on Evangelism where the whole church is represented and share the story and the testimony and is not from far from now. Uh, the United Methodist Church will hear that story because Robert Tuttle is being appointed as general president of, uh, uh, in charge of evangelism worldwide in the United Methodist Church. <laughs> you, you are, now you know. <laughs> Something is going on. I want, you to, I want you to hear this because it will, it will do you good. Uh, most of you are businessmen, people that work eight to five, and you need to hear that through God all things are possible. And, uh, and I want to tell you, I never cared for barbecue in my life. Never cared for anything that is barb. <laughs> but when I ate that barbecue, fell in love with it, and I think it's just not the barbecue. It's the Holy Spirit in that place. It's an anointed place. Uh, 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 the restaurant, if you um, uh, pardon the expression, uh, it, it's, uh, he, 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 when he built the structure, he, had, he closed his eyes. <laughs> There's a door that's like this, like this, and then like this. And as you come in, you feel at home. For some reason, if you, I think the best possible thing I could do now is to preach on the gathering. <laughs> but uh, uh, I have something to share with you in the line of miracles very briefly. I know you're already edified and built up and comforted. This has been a beautiful day. The Lord has ministered to us. I want to thank Wesley for coming and thank Sam and Oscar for coming. We've traveled everywhere. We've been together now for the last, I don't know, more than five years now. This has just been going three years with you. So, so, so ask it's been more than, more than three years. Maybe five? Five years. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting combination. A, a, a coronal from Kentucky, a soloist that sings beautiful, and a short Brazilian. <laughs> the best looking of the three. Hallelujah. Would you open your Bible very briefly in John chapter 4? And uh, I want to share very briefly with you. I, I mean very briefly because uh, uh, it can be said briefly. I've shared with you on miracles of the Lord Jesus. And I shared with you the variables in miracles need to be considered. And if you understand how the miracle operates and faith is activated, you can activate your faith in knowing how to surrender to the Lord will provide you with a miracle. The actual act of surrendering is one of the most difficult things in a miracle to take place. For to surrender that which needs to be surrendered, that is outside of your human knowledge, is only indicated by the Word of God. And when the Word of God is then received and respected in honor, it can activate a miracle. Remember that Jesus reprimanded Satan with three verses of Deuteronomy. It is written, it is written, it is written. And may I remind you, you have the whole Bible in your hand, and if you simply know how to use it and take authority and be able to, to say what you need to say, Satan will not come against you. Uh, chapter 4 of John. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, his, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. When the Lord heard this, he left Judea and went back to Galilee once more. Father, we thank you for this evening, Lord. Now bless us, Father, we pray in Jesus' precious and holy name at this very moment. Amen. When Jesus returned to Galilee, in this trip, 
He came through Samaria. Verse 4, now he had to go through Samaria. Uh, uh, it's more than meet the eye because most Jews coming from the north would come on the left side of the Jordan and then cross it unto Jerusalem. The Jordan runs this way and here is Palestine. Jordan runs this way. Jews from the north would go on the other side of the Jordan, run down and then cross unto Jerusalem for they will not come into areas that belong to Samaritans. Now, Jesus took the long road, and if you know the terrain uh, from any point in the north or at the, at, the, at the west of Palestine, he had to cross a diagonal line coming into Samaria. And the terrain is rocks over rocks and rocks and more rocks and mountains and desolate terrain. And Jesus came through Samaria, so he came uh, uh, to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot uh, of the ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Now in Genesis 48, 21, 22, it says that this land was to Joseph. Shechem by descendants was Jesus' homeland, his property. And so he returned to his property where he, by decree and by inheritance, owned the land. If you own a piece of property and you know the value of taking authority over that piece of property, it will bless you much. Many miracles have occurred when the people in charge of their land learn to take authority over their very land. It is a biblical rule of knowledge, a rule of thumb as to spiritual authority. Territorial spiritual authority begins when you know where you live and who lives there and how to take authority over your ground. Jesus had to come to a very difficult six-day walking trip in order to find someone in need. He wasn't moved by the Pharisees act of criticizing that John, uh, Jesus' disciples were gaining uh, more than John. He wasn't interested in what the Pharisees thought. He came out of uh, uh, Judea into Galilee once more, moved by the fact that there was a woman in a place to where his descendants drunk water for sustenance, and he needed to meet her. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. Most people in those days, when they came to drink, they came at night. Uh, about five o'clock is the time to come after you work in the, in the field or, or, or dealt with the, with the flock. You would come and pick up your water and, and cook your meal and close the day. Uh, in several places in the scriptures, uh, women and young ladies seem to come at noon to take water. Young people would somehow at noonday come and replenish the home uh, with that beautiful water. Jacob's well is the only, uh, is one of the most uh, famous places in the homeland uh, of the Lord Jesus. Uh, it is 130 feet deep. Uh, it is considered to be uh, in the scriptures in John chapter 4. Uh, it is the only place you find this passage. And so the Lord came into a place that was his home ground in order to understand, in order to comprehend, in order to express to you and I what really this story is all about and as to who you are. It was about 12 noon. And a Samaritan woman came uh, to draw water. Now, let me stop and say that this is not a miracle. It's not one of the 37 miracles of Jesus. And the reason why I brought this scripture to share with you this evening is to let you know how precious you are and I and we are in the sight of the Lord. And how can a miracle of salvation occur by simple uh, obedience to the Holy Spirit's presence to be at the right place in your life? Uh, and in the case of Ascapu, he led thousands of people uh, unto the kingdom of God in the days that he ministered at this barbecue. And he will lead thousands of people overseas in many places, more than he would have done if he was at that local church. 
And you see, God has a way of moving you to where you need to be if you're obedient to him. Now, I'm a son of a United, a Methodist minister uh, uh, that served the church for 37 years in the, in the city, in the country of Brazil. Uh, I came to this country uh, with uh, 16, 17 years of age. My father gave me one-way ticket uh, to New York City. And I've been here ever since. And that doesn't make sense. But I want you to know that this ministry is deeply involved in the renewal uh, movement within the heart of the United Methodist Church. Not only at the heart, but at the heart, at the, at the uh, I would say in parentheses, at the guts of the United Methodist Church. It's very interesting that God moves this way in order to perform his will. In the case of the woman of Samaritan, uh, 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 Samaritan woman, uh, Jesus was dealing with greater things than we were able to comprehend. Greater things happen. Beautiful things happen. Read with me very briefly. When the Samaritan woman uh, came to draw water at 12 o'clock, an expectant hour, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman responded, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate uh, with Samaritans. If you drunk from a cup used by a Samaritan, you would be uh, pronounced unclean. The matter of uncleanliness was exaggerated to a point to where if you had a skin disease of any kind, it was considered leprosy and you'd have to stay with the leper uh, outside. The understanding of cleaning and unclean was dealt with outside of the body because it could not be dealt inside. They could not see the heart, but they could see the skin. And so Jesus was not only taking a very serious chance of being deeply criticized by the whole community because he took a stand. He dealt with the unclean. I want you to know that you will not be able to see the kingdom of God until you deal with the unclean. The only way to really please the Holy Spirit 100% in your relationship with others is to be in prayer for those that are hurting more than you are. If your hurt supersedes, I want you to hear this, if your hurt supersedes the one you meet, you should be asking for prayer. But if your hurt does not supersede their hurt, it's your responsibility to get to them. The only way you're going to activate the power of the Holy Spirit in a way that will bring the anointing of God is to deal with somebody's hurt and try to, and try to uh, deal with yours later. If you are in adultery, the best way you can deal with it is to be able to be in prayer for someone who is in worse shape than you are. You see, we understood up to now that unless we are in state of grace, completely in state of grace in the sight of God, we're not able to minister to anyone else. This is the clear understanding of how to perform ministry to others. But when you have dealt with your sin and brought before the Lord and your sin is not yet and not anymore in control of your life, that gives you authority to begin to deal with people who are in horrible need. If you know how to take authority. And in this case, not only Jesus had territorial authority, but he had Holy Spiritual authority, for he knew she was going to be there before she came. He was led by the Holy Spirit. This woman came not by chance. The two met. And so Jesus begins the conversation by a way that you probably could begin by simply saying, uh, uh, Brother Oscar, would you like to, uh, do you have some barbecue I could eat from you, please? My sister, would you give me uh, some water? Uh, could I talk with you about something in Jesus' name? Can we sit down over coffee and just discuss about the kingdom? And remember that he could have begun a conversation that led into all kinds of riddles. But he started by simply looking around and saying, this is a well. And I know who this well belonged to. This well belonged to Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes. And the land that I am is the land of Naphtali and Zebulun. 
And it is a blessing of Jacob unto Zebulun and Naphtali that they live by the sea. Ten for ten miles from the sea between the, the lake of the, the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean. And so the surrounding areas, all that you see and all that he saw was the place where he would live for almost 75% of his ministry. He knew his surroundings, he knew the area, he knew the water was abundant all around him. And so he just had to say to this woman, looking at the well, simply, could you help me with a drink of water, please? Would you assist me and help me with a drink of water? He could have gotten the water himself, but that wouldn't be the wise thing to do. You don't begin a conversation when you are in charge. You simply come to a place to where the other person is more important than you are. The reason why Dr. Oscar Pooh has been successful uh, is because his heart belongs to God, number one. And number two, he loves people as a preacher should. And he's got one of the greatest pulpits in North Georgia. I believe that the greatest pulpit in North Georgia, or in Georgia, in your conference, is in L.A.J., Georgia. It's a barbecue pit. He gets in touch with more people than First Methodist in Atlanta ever will. And interesting. Is that interesting? You see, you are in a place to where you can reach the lost. But the problem is, you call yourself a Samaritan. And your uncleanliness has separated you from the masses because, see, you happen just to be someone who is from a particular church. The day when you belong to Jesus, things will change. Now search your heart. If you consider you a Samaritan, then you are unclean. And if you are unclean, you are living your uncleanness by allowing the church to do evangelism and the preacher and you to be a, spect spect a spectator. The miracle of Ella is that Oscar used to be a man who associated to those uh, uh, who he dealt with and now they're coming to him in the thousands and he's able to share the love of Jesus through music in a way that is so powerful. Listen, when you hear Amazing Grace, how great the song and eat barbecue at the same time, it sounds to me heavenly. <laughs> <laughs> and so Jesus knew how to approach a situation in his environment and to deal with it. The form of communicating with the lost is important because you see, if you don't, you're not communicating with yourself. And if you don't like yourself, you'll never be able to communicate with anybody else. You probably say, Rick, uh, why are you, you sort of uh, so relaxed in the pulpit? I know who I am and I like myself. You probably say, I'm short. I'll tell you, I'm 10 feet tall. <laughs> you probably say, I'm a foreigner. Not really. I'm not a Samaritan. I'm not a Jew. I'm a child of God, heir of the kingdom. <laughs> you see, my identity is being uh, discovered. I know who I am. <laughs> And because I know who I am, I can't stand on the eye because he is. Would you give me a drink, please? If you, and the woman said, sir, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me a drink? Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God, who is, is it that asks for a drink, you would have asked him and he would give a new living water. Meaning the living water here is salvation. If you knew who is talking to you and who is in your presence, you could ask something that you, you would receive and you'd receive it if you knew how to ask. Most of the people you're going to meet are in need of a miracle of one kind or another. But preceding, the, uh, 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 dealing with next Sunday, you are in the place to bring the greatest miracle to anywhere, anyone you meet. If you know what to say, when to, to be, need to be said. Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. That's a cop out. It always it is this way when you deal with the miracle of salvation. Because the person that is the recipient of that blessing will try to get you out of the conversation every time by bringing something that is totally relevant to what you're trying to say. In other words, I don't have a cup and you have to get way down there to get water and we don't know how we're going to do it. 
Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drunk from it himself, as did his sons and his flocks and herds? You don't talk to Jesus. This is his land. He's dealing with his descendants. This is his environment. This is his hometown. You know, out of Naphtali and Zebulun. You know, the blessings to Judah and the blessings to Reuben and the blessings to Joseph and the blessings to Benjamin and the blessings to all of the 12 tribes were powerful. But the blessing to Zebulun was almost nothing. Go live by the sea. Big deal. But by the sea is where Jesus found eight of his disciples. Zebulun was one of the most blessed of all because out of the, the, the guts of Zebulun came Peter, James, and John, and Matthew. And so you see, the Lord understood this woman. Out of this very earth came the ones who carried the gospel to the four corners of the earth. You never know who you're talking to. When you met Oscar, you probably uh, thought of himself as just a large man. Well, this large man last year fasted 40 days. And anybody who can force fast 40 days got to have some integrity. I don't believe Oscar is a man who has a barbecue pit. He is going to deliver many from the pit of hell before he's over. <laughs> Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirst again. He did not accept the idea there was no cup to draw. He said simply, now let's get back to the subject. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I, never, uh, th that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water. Well and up into eternal life, moving forward, deep into the very cores of a thousand years of blessing. You see, the water that he was dealing with is the water of many generations. It's been there years and generations past. And here's the son of the almighty God looking at the place to where he himself came from. And looking at the water that was drunk by his forefathers, earthly father. Looking to the heavenly father and saying to himself, this woman don't understand that this whole terrain here is, is more than she can understand. The world had made Samaria an unclean place. But Jesus chose it to bring salvation to the lost. Panama City and Panama City Beach might be visioned by you as a lost place. But the day you begin taking authority and territorial authority over that area, it will be the greatest place of salvation in these parts. You see, that area belongs to you. Panama City belongs to you. And I want to share something with you about that. Territorial authority begins when you establish yourself in that place and call upon the name of God. It's not easily done. Uh, every biblical concept of territorial authority is done with instruments of praise. You go to the location to where bondage is and you have the highest place within the area is where you should be. From there you should proclaim to the north, south, east, and west with your instruments and march down that from that place into the whole area and proclaim Jesus as Lord. And take authority over the territorial area that has been affected by sin and reprimand the name of the Lord Jesus. Every force of darkness that will try to move in there and every business that tries to implement unrighteousness in the midst of your children. And when you decree in the name of Jesus, this is the way it's going to be, that's the way it's going to be. Nothing will flourish in that place anymore that is contrary to what you established to be. Every business, the city of Athens, Georgia, who's been, who's been contrary to the will of God, has been uh, demanding to the poor, has been uh, uh, illegal, irreverent to the needs of the people. I have decided to go in the midst of the business and decree its failure. And everyone I prayed for has closed. And everyone I prayed to succeed has succeeded. And you see, I'm finding out that this finger is awful powerful. 
You see, in you resides the authority of the Lord Jesus. In you, there's the, the power that raised Jesus from the dead. You are the embodiment of the resurrected Lord. This is your territory. But if you stay within your grounds, taking care of the property, you're going to miss your vision for your vision is where the lost is in this city. You have brought, been brought here not to somehow tell the United Methodist Church you can be revived. You have brought here to save the lost of, these, of this area. This is your vision. This is your calling. Yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The woman said, oh, sir, give me this water so that I won't thirst, get thirst, and have to come here to draw. What other words? I want to get what you're talking about. You know, I, I just want to have some of it, you know. <laughs> when you've had barbecue at, at, at Colonel Oscar Poole's place, you will never forget. You don't, you don't understand. You, you, you don't understand. You have to go over there. You go over there, you eat it, and then you come back and tell everybody, how was it? You have to go back again. I caught myself driving over there just to have lunch. It is not the actual food and the ingredients, it's the environment and the men behind it. They come here because there is someone speaking in the name of the Lord Jesus. Yes, and let me share something with you. Uh, you, all, we will, you will have a mighty preacher and a powerful preacher when you have taken his place. When you have done what he does. When you have spoken as he speaks. When you have prayed as he prayed, when you have visited as he visited, when you have given as he gives, that's the way to build a big church. You say, Rick, but uh, my preacher don't do nothing. <laughs> well, that's a lie. <laughs> the best way to lift a minister is to intercede for him continuously and pray for him. You know, my father had a group of four men that would come before he preached and lay hands over him before his sermon. And they would pray for him for 15, 20 minutes. Then they would take him by his arm and put him into a VW, drive to that place, follow him to the pulpit, and let him preach. When it was over, they would grab him and put him back in the car and take it home. Now, 73 years of age, do, they doing that meant that they interceded for him day and night. Day and night, day and night, day and night. They're coming here in order to have communion with the Holy Spirit that is within you. Hallelujah. If the Holy Spirit is in the preacher but it's not in you, they won't have communion. It's very difficult for people to have communion with a pastor. That would be considered idolatry. They have communion with the Holy Spirit. If the preacher is off, it's not because he's off, it's because you're off. <laughs> The way, to, the way to, to minister to the lost is to agree that we're here for one purpose, to bring the lost to Jesus at any cost. Bring the lost to Jesus at any cost. The greatest miracle can ever happen in this city is you bring someone to Jesus next Sunday. You bring them here yourself. That's a miracle. I've got a bunch I'm working with. I used to go to Brazil every, uh, every, every month and I had to pay $1,000 to go to Brazil. In this last year, we stopped in Orlando, Florida, and the man came to me and says, uh, you're a preacher, aren't you? Could you pray for my wife? Well, I said, you're the fellow who did our reservation, isn't it? Yes, I am. I'm the, I'm the manager of the, of the airport, and my wife is outside. Could you pray for her? So we went there. I don't know if you were together. We went there and prayed for her as a Chinese girl, and we prayed that she be healed of a heart murmur. And she was healed. Now, I, I, I don't have to pay to go to Brazil anymore. They don't accept my money at Brazil Airlines. Glory to God. <laughs> now, you know what he's saying to me? He's saying to me that he wants to be saved. He's crying out. And I'm just waiting upon the Lord to tell me to jump. When the Lord says, jump, whoo, I'll jump all over that man. He don't know what hit him. <laughs> He left his wife last week. 
And she called me and he called me. He, her in New York City and him in Los Angeles. I said to both of them, you commit adultery because you don't love your wife. You're going to have a hard time with Jesus. Don't you let Satan come in like that. Let's get together and get back home. I won't talk to you again. <laughs> They're home and the miracle is about to happen. You see, they come because of you. I, wanna, I want to finish. It says, he told her, after she asked for the living water, he told her, go and deal with your sin. It says, go call your husband and come back. But really what the whole thing meant, uh, deal with your sin. The greatest miracle that you can deal tonight with is your sin. Deal with your sin. How do you deal with it? You bow before the Lord and ask him to forgive you. I saw your pastor this morning inside of his office. I know we can't go into details about the conversation, but he hugged this woman and asked her to forgive him and her to forgive him. And they loved each other and they cried in each other's arms. That's the way a church grows. When a pastor asks forgiveness to a member of the congregation and there is forgiveness between the two, Satan won't come here anymore. Let me ask you something. Is anybody here like to ask anybody forgiveness? If you have talked about anybody else in this church without <laughs> the permission of the Holy Spirit, you need to ask forgiveness. <laughs> Nobody will be saved over here for six months until you do that. Do you know why it's going to be salvation here? It's because your pastor knows how to humble himself, being right or wrong. And that's the way the church grows. You see, Jesus, by coming to Samaria, was simply saying to the whole world, don't believe in what they say. You're not unclean because I make you clean. You've got to have this living water. <laughs> Jesus came to the world to save sinners just like you and I, and he's telling you, you ain't unclean because I can make you clean. The power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Great is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And when you know how to take authority over the forces of darkness, you will not sin anymore. Do you have something to ask forgiveness this morning, this evening to somebody in this congregation? Is there any bold men and women who like to stand and say, I want to ask this church to forgive me for what I said, for what I've done, for what I've, I've meant to say, for what I did and what I didn't do? Is anybody here who somehow needs to ask forgiveness to somebody in this congregation? It will do you good. It will be a miracle. You've done some things to folks in here that you quite, it just happened and you don't know how you're doing. It just happens. So you ask them to forgive you if you, if you misjudged them or used them or, or perhaps just didn't treat them right. Did you hear that? Well, praise the Lord. Thank you, my brother, Margaret.